early in the morning, before the sun rises, the women approach, carrying spices. There on the ground, rocky shards, burst from a tomb no longer barred. The men come running, bending to see. They find only linen. The body is free. Alone among the flowers, the woman weeps. A gardener comes, touches her cheek. Two disciples grieve on the road. Don't they know that it's all been foretold? Give me some food. It's me. I'm alive. Thomas, touch my hands and hear my sigh. He makes them breakfast there on the beach. Peter, you're mine. Now go feed my sheep. Welcome. We are really grateful to be here with you today. Thank you for coming on this special Sunday. Thank you for those of you tuning in online. And I couldn't help but reflect on where we left things when we were together here for Good Friday. And I began to think back and try to picture the people that went to the tomb that morning in sorrow and in grief, not knowing what God had already done, not knowing the hope that was about to be revealed, not knowing the victory that was theirs. They were in that place of darkness and despair. And so many times we find ourselves in similar places. We are not yet aware of how God has shown up. So this morning, we invite you to stand if you're able and let's worship. Let's continue to reflect on who Jesus is.
has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome.
Party, didn't you? <laughs> That's all right. Hey, that was good. Never, never will we forget the glorious thing that Jesus has done for us. And now I feel so appropriate in saying he is risen. Yeah. Happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. Please greet someone around you before you are seated. Greet someone in the chat. All 
All right. You guys sound like you're in a celebratory mood. That is fantastic. Again, welcome. We are so glad to be here celebrating Resurrection Sunday with you all. Let's give Jesus a hand. Honestly, I just like seeing so many of you here and envisioning so many of you tuning in online. I just wanted to hear you cheer a little bit more. So thank you for that. My name is Shauna Bourne. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are so grateful to be here with you today, celebrating Jesus, welcoming you all. If you are visiting for the first time, you just want to say a special welcome. We're happy everyone's here, but this is just a little special, little special welcome to those who are visiting. We hope that you are feeling the love today and we would love to meet you. And so, yeah, yeah. We would love to meet you. Uh, if you are up for it, you can hop out to the visitor area in the gathering area after service. We'd love to say hi, let you know a little bit more about Woodland Hills. If you're tuning in online and you're visiting, we say welcome to you as well. And there is an online bulletin where you can fill out a visitor card and get more information about Woodland Hills. Uh, a couple of ways that we keep everyone informed about what's going on around here is one, we have an app. There's an app for that, and Woodland Hills has one. Uh, you can go onto your phone into whatever app store you use and just search Woodland Hills Church, and the app will come up. On the Woodland Hills app, you can request prayer. You can listen to sermons. You can find out about different activities going on. You can give an offering if you want. It's just a great way to stay connected while on the go. We also have a newsletter called The Rundown. And I love The Rundown because this is where we get to read blogs of stories of things happening within our community. And it's just a great way to stay connected. Also to hear about different things coming up. If you want to sign up for The Rundown, that comes out about twice a month. And you can also do that online. So we hope that you will stay connected in those ways. And yes, this is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, but it is also the last uh, day of the month, which means it's the last day of our food drive for the food shelf. And you guys remember we had a goal of $20,000. We let you know last week that we surpassed that goal, but we just want to let you know we more than doubled it, over $45,000. Praise the Lord. And that really does deserve all of our celebration and praise because this means that we can really love and serve our neighbors that are in need. So thank you for contributing financially with bringing in food and also the paper bags. It is all going to be so needed and so necessary. The day's not over yet, though. So if you're thinking, oh, man, I meant to get in on that, you have until the end of the day today. We don't want to exclude anyone. So uh, you can help us uh, further serve our community in that way. Again, we are so glad that you are here. I'm going to let you know a little secret. Dr. Gregory Boyd is back in the house. We're super excited. And Jesus is here too. So let us, let us uh, transition uh, in our worship time to a uh, time of offering. If you do give to Woodland Hills, you can do so on that app I mentioned. You can do that online, or if you're here in-house and you like to physically give, there are boxes on the back walls of the worship center. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that when we come uh, heavy-hearted and we're expecting more of the same, you show up in a glorious way to bring hope and to bring renewal and to bring new life and to bring restoration. And Lord, we celebrate that today. We celebrate all that you accomplished by your sacrifice for us, but ultimately that you rose and that you are alive and you are here with us today. We thank you for that, Lord, that you loved each and every single person here and tuning in, and that is why you are alive amongst us today. We give you praise. Lord, we thank you for the way that this community comes together to serve the neighborhood and the body, and that is so beautiful. And right now we ask, Lord, that whatever is given, that you would take, that you would bless, and that you would use to further your kingdom so that we can truly be the hands and feet of Jesus in the spaces in which we occupy. We thank you, Lord, that we truly are learning to love together, and that means that we walk these things out in the power of your spirit because of your love. Shine that so bright for us today, Lord. We give you all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hi. Welcome 
welcome welcome to Woodland Hills. Whether you are in person or online, we hope we hope that both your heart and mind are inspired today and that you enjoy our service. We believe God's love extends to everyone, everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, and no matter what you believe. Only this kind of love can change the world. And we hope that our church community can be a place where you get to know the love of God, the beauty of sharing that love with others, and the joy of belonging. Again, welcome, welcome to, to Woodland Hills. Hills. We're learning to love together. together. Amen. Good morning, Woodland Hills. Let's try this one more time. Christ is risen. Listen, indeed, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm uh, Greg Boyd. If you've been new to the church here in the last three or four weeks, you haven't seen me. Uh, I've been out getting a new knee, hallelujah. And uh, I, it, it feels so good to be back here, really, just being with all of you. I, I've really missed uh, being here. Uh, but man, does it feel good to have a knee that works. I, 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 I'm feeling good. In the last nine months, in the last nine months, I've had uh, my back fixed, right? And then I now I have my knee fixed. So the two major pains in my life for the last seven years or so are gone. And I am a happy camper. Woo! So, yeah, it's uh, never have I appreciated our preaching team more than I have the last four weeks. Uh, weren't they just fantastic? We have got, we're so blessed. Dan, uh, Dan and Shauna. Uh, and, and Cedric and, and our new friend up in uh, Canada, Jeremy, uh, just a great job really unpacking these letters in the book of Revelation. So uh, hats off to them. I'm just honored to be part of this team. Uh, it's great. So this is Easter, and we're going to be talking about the resurrection. And I want to preach from a passage of scripture that I don't think I've ever preached from before. Uh, it's found in the Gospel of Luke, his resurrection account. Uh, it's in chapter 24, and it starts as verse 36. So these disciples are here in Jerusalem, and, and they have heard rumors that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, but, um, and they're talking about it, but they hadn't seen him yet. And so this is where this narrative picks up. It says, while these disciples will, were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. He just, boom, he shows up. And he said to them, peace be with you. Oh, it wasn't so much peace. They were freaked out. <laughs> they were startled and terrified. And they thought that they were seeing a ghost. So he said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. See, it's, it's me. It's I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, presumably to show the scars that were still there. Yet for all their joy... They were still disbelieving and wondering. They were just conflicted. And he said to them, have you got anything to eat? <laughs> they gave him some broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. No doubt with their jaws dropped open, staring at him. <laughs> so it, they're talking about Jesus, and boom, all of a sudden he's there in their midst. And they freak out. They think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, look, you guys, me. This is my body. This is my hands. These are my feet. These are my scars. They're happy about that, but they're still confused. He says, okay, you need a little more proof. What do you got to eat? <laughs> you think I'm an apparition or a hallucination or something like that? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, hey, watch this. Give me some fish. And he eats some fish. You know, I don't know how fish works in, a, in, a, in, in the digestive tract of a resurrected person, uh, but that, that's just kind of an interesting thing. What I want us to see here this morning is that Jesus, when he came out of the tomb, he came with his body. And the body was the same body he had before the resurrection. Uh, same, they, they could recognize him. Uh, the same body, had the same scars, and yet, well, that body was his body for sure. It, was, it had been changed. Something radically different had happened to it. Uh, you know, flesh and bones. They, they, flesh and bones don't usually rise from the dead. Flesh and bones usually doesn't just appear in a room. Usually you've got to make an entrance and an exit. Jesus just appears. Uh, in John, it says he walked through a wall after eating some fish, and I don't know how that would work. <laughs> Left the fish behind. Um, so there's something funky. He's up in Jerusalem, or up in Galilee, and then the next thing we read, he's down there in Jerusalem. There's a 95-mile distance there, and somehow Jesus just sort of transports that. It's like this resurrected body of his 
could tell a transport or something. He pops up, and this is why the resurrection accounts are hard to follow sometimes, because he's popping up there, and then he's gone. He pops up over there, and he's gone. So there's continuity as well as discontinuity uh, with this resurrected body of Jesus. There's sameness and there's difference. It's the same body. It's the same Jesus. They recognize him, but there's something different about him. He's operating by the different laws of physics, or, or he's operating from a different dimension or, or, or something like that. Now, now, here's why I think it's important to know that Jesus came out of the tomb with his body. It's because a lot of people, in fact, I, I, I better be a majority of people, if you ask them to summarize in one word, what is the significance of the resurrection of Jesus? I think a lot of folks would say, well, it's, it's so that I can go to heaven when I die. So my soul can go to heaven when I die. That's the afterlife that they're hoping for. My soul can leave this crab body and, and, and go to heaven. See, and if that's, if that's the story that, that you live in about the resurrection, that when I die, my soul goes to heaven. Well, see, in that story, your body's not very important. In fact, in that story, the physical world's not really important. The important thing is that your soul goes to heaven. The spiritual part of you goes to heaven. And we sometimes, whether we say this explicitly or not, a lot of folks seem to treat the world, the whole physical world, as simply a prop. It's like a temporary thing here to get us to the really important thing, which is heaven. And if it's just a prop, well, then you don't need to worry about it very much. You don't need to take care of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a temporary thing. And that's why I think a lot of Christians just don't show very much concern for the well-being of the earth and the animal kingdom, the physical world. In fact, in some circles, you're kind of looked at it with suspicion. Oh, well, you're a liberal if you care about the earth and the kingdom, even though that's the first mandate that God gives us in the Bible, take care of the earth and the animal kingdom, we still sometimes just treat it like it's a prop, like they're just there for us to use and then discard as we go on to the important place, which is supposed to be heaven. That is, folks, I submit to you a seriously truncated and distorted version of the gospel. And the greatest proof that that version of the gospel is off is that when Jesus came out of the tomb, he had his body with him. <laughs> his body was resurrected. He didn't come out as some disembodied spirit, Tinker Bell floating around in some way or something like that. No, he's, his body was with him. To be resurrected is to be, have your body resurrected. And, and, and see, for God, salvation isn't just about saving your soul while discarding your body, salvation involves the whole person. It is your body and your soul. In fact, salvation, we're going to see here in a moment, involves the whole of creation. God didn't just become a man and die on the cross to save your soul. He came to save everything, to transform everything, to heal everything. And the hope of the New Testament is not about what happens to you the moment after you die. The hope of the New Testament is what happens to everybody at the end of the age, when there'll be the resurrection uh, of the dead, and the purging and the transformation of all of creation. Now, that leaves the question, well, then what happens to you when you die? If, if the hope is for your, your body to be resurrected at the end, um, then, then what happens to your spirit in between? And see, most Jews, in the, or a lot of Jews in the first century, they believe that when you die, that, that, that you just stop existing. And then you come alive again, you're resurrected at the end of the age. It's called soul sleep. You're, you're, there, there's no awareness there. And some scholars argue that that's what the Apostle Paul believed. In fact, up until about 20 years ago, that's what I thought the Apostle Paul believed because it refers to dead folks as being asleep, which implies unconsciousness. Though I've, I've come to change my opinion a little bit on that, at least I'm inclined to think differently about it, for two reasons. One is there are a few biblical passages that are really hard to explain on a soul sleep basis. Uh, for example, in, in Philippians, um, Paul says, chapter 1, he says, I don't know what's better. Uh, to die and go and be with the Lord or to stick around here and minister to you? And he says, personally, I'd rather go and be with the Lord, but for your th sake, I think it's good that I stick around. It implies, it implies, A, Paul had a death wish, but B, it implies that, uh, no, he was okay with dying, that's all. But it, he, he's, he's assuming that the minute he dies, he's going to, in some sense, be with the Lord. So that's one of the things that kind of convinced me that, 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 that we're aware after death. The other thing is just, there's just a lot of really interesting uh, scientific evidence that increasing now that, that, that concerning near-death experiences. I don't know if you've ever looked into this, but accounts of people who, who were clinically dead. And then in, in some of these, and I'm not endorsing everything that goes on when these people die, and they, 
But in some cases, there's uh, uh, demonstrable proof that these folks were awake while their body was dead. Uh, really bizarre accounts. In this one account, for example, and I could give you a number, but um, this lady died, and she then reports about how she saw her body. She was kind of hovering above her body, and then she recounted the conversations that were happening, happening uh, at the time and uh, a few of the things, some of the details, uh, even though she was clinically brain dead. And then she floated to the top of this hospital and then floated out towards the edge of the hospital and looked down. And when she looked down, she saw on the ledge uh, underneath this, this window this uh, red shoe. Uh, it was a kid's shoe. It was untied. It had some gum on the bottom of it. And she describes it in great detail. And then they revive her, and she, she comes alive again. And she tells a story. So somebody goes up and try, a group of people went up and, to check on this, and it ended up being in the window of a storage room because they hadn't used it for a couple of years. So that, that shoe, however it got there, had been there for quite a while. And you couldn't see the shoe anyway other than being right above it looking down, which you wouldn't get to because the whole room was a storage room. And yet, she, 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 she knows stories like that just have convinced me that there is awareness after death. But here's the thing. That's not the hope of the New Testament. That's not, oh, yay, my awareness survives the, the death of my body. That's not the, the, the victory of the resurrection. Uh, that's not the complete state. Even Paul, he, I think he believed that he would be with the Lord. But he says in 2 Corinthians 5 that to, to be with the Lord before the resurrection at the end of the age, he says, I'll, I'll be with the Lord, but I'll be found naked. And I'm longing to be clothed with my heavenly tent. That's a weird passage. But I think what he's referring to, the heavenly tent is his resurrected body. And the idea is that, okay, he's with the Lord, so that's good. Uh, and who knows what else is going on there, but... He's still longing for something else, which is to be united with his body. Because we are created body and soul. We're created psychosomatic unities. Our self involves different dimensions of us. And so you can't, until that happens, until all of us, every part of us is redeemed, there's an incompleteness there. The hope of eternal life is the hope for the resurrection at the end of the age. So lock this in. God is not going to abandon your physical body. And God is not going to give up on this physical creation. Because God created your physical body, and he called it good. And God created this physical creation, and he called it good. And what God creates, and what God calls good, God loves. And when God loves something and loves someone, he doesn't abandon them. He doesn't give up on them. He fights for them. <laughs> he's a fighter. He doesn't give up on real estate. No, this is his creation. And see, the creation as it is right now, Kind of in a sorry condition. Uh, Paul describes it in Romans 8 as this entire creation is groaning. Right now, this entire creation is under the influence of these destructive principalities and powers. And so uh, this is why all the laws of nature as they operate right now all point in the direction of death. The law of entropy. We're all, this is why our bodies wear out. That's why you got to get knee replacements sometimes after a while. And then back replacements. And who knows what else is going to get replaced before this, this story's over. If things wear out. The creation right now is not as God created it to be, but the promise of the resurrection is that it will not stay this way. Hallelujah. Uh, what we see when we see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, is what it looks like for a human body to finally be freed from the corruption of the principalities and powers. When we see the resurrected Jesus, we're seeing what it's like for a human body to be fully freed from the damaging effect of sin. We're looking at what it looks like for a human body and therefore for a slice of creation to be fully healed, to be fully transformed, to be fully purged of all cryptic influences, to be fully perfected. That's what we're seeing in the resurrected Jesus. When you look at the resurrected Jesus, we're seeing life as God always intended it to be lived. Life that's lived in union with God and, and participating in the life and the love of God. That's what the resurrected Jesus demonstrates. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, this perishable body, this right now, our bodies are perishable. They're perishing right now as I'm talking. Uh, but uh, this perishable body, body's got to put on imperishability. And this mortal body's got to put on immortality. Earlier he says that what is corruptible has got to put on incorruptibility. So the very laws of this creation are going to be fundamentally changed. Right now, the laws are all working towards perishability, the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. All things tend towards chaos, randomness, 
Everything's winding down. Everything's breaking down. Everything is corruptible. Everything is falling apart. At the end of the age, when God culminates, brings to a close this present epic, oh, how different it will be. Because then all of our bodies, and this is the promise of the resurrection, that what happened to Jesus' body is going to happen to everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. What happened to Jesus' body is going to happen to all of creation. It will all be changed. The laws are going to be fundamentally changed. It's going to be no longer working in the direction of death, but now working in the direction of life. That sounds more like the kind of creation that an all-good, all-loving God would create. Hallelujah. Fundamentally changed and transformed. Apparently we'll still be able to eat. That's good. <laughs> and we'll find out what happens to it after you eat it. All right. So here's the thing. The, good, the, 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 the resurrection isn't just good news for, 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 for your spirit, but not your body. No, it's, it's good news for your spirit and your body. It's not just good news for human beings but not animals. No, it's good news for human beings and animals. And it's not just good news for the earth. It's good news for the entire cosmos. Do you see how truncated this little story about, I want to go to, where's my spirit go when I die? How that's just so, totally waters down what the resurrection's all about. But the transformation of everything, hallelujah. So here, it, it, here's two passages that show this, two of my favorite passages in scripture. Colossians 1, Paul says that, for in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Look how I'm walking around here, man. This is, uh, <laughs> I've been able to walk. I, it's been hard to stand up here for the last couple of years, but ah, this, is, this is great. All the fullness of the Godhead, all the fullness of deity dwelt in, in, in Christ. Um, and, and then through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, uh, making peace through the blood of his cross. So God was dwelling in fully in Christ. Everything that makes God God was in, was in Christ. That's why we say he is fully God and fully human. He's God become a human being. And why did God become a human being? So your soul could go to heaven when you die? Uh, it includes that, but man, it goes way beyond that because he became one with, with, with the man Jesus Christ and united himself to, with creation to reconcile all things to himself and to one another. And he's doing it by means of the cross, the love of God that's revealed on the cross. He's bringing peace, bringing shalom to all things in heaven, bringing shalom to all things on earth. That's what God's up to right now. The love of God is uniting things, healing things. Uh, everything that he has created, he loves. Everything he loves, he fights for, and he's fighting for creation. That's what the cross and the resurrection is all about. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 1, verses 8 and 9. And uh, I'll read here the, the message version. I like it. In this case, he says, God thought of everything. He provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out beforehand in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, in Christ. Everything in deepest heaven and everything on planet earth. In Christ, God, is, through the cross, he's bringing together everything. He's, su he's summing up everything in Christ. Uh, Paul uses this very strange word, anakephaleao. And uh, it literally means to be summed up or brought together under one head. And somehow, in some way, God is now working everywhere in everything to bring things in harmony, to harmonize them in Christ, to reconcile them in Christ. To bring God's shalom to them in Christ. Everything in heaven, everything on earth, everything past, everything present. The good, the bad, and the ugly. God is redeeming it all. Amen. Amen. That's why Christians should never be living in regret. Oh, how could I have done such a terrible thing? Yeah, it was a terrible thing. It was a stupid thing. It was a bad thing. It was a harmful thing. Maybe you can't re redo that. You can't put together scrambled eggs. Maybe you just screwed it up. And it's, 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 it's unscrew upable. Okay, fine. That is what it is. But what's bigger, God or your unscrew-upable mess? It, what's more intelligent, God or your unscrew-upable mess? God in his infinite love and in his infinite wisdom is going to find some way to bring good out of all evil. Everything the enemy intends for evil, God intends for good. And he turns it around. That's what Romans 8, 28 is all about. And in the end, we'll see how God has just created this beautiful tapestry in Christ. Somehow the love of God has, has purged away everything that is inconsistent with his character and refined everything that is consistent with his character. So in the end, what we have is this beautiful, beautiful tapestry of everything reflecting his character. 
And the material that he used to create this tapestry is everything. Everything that's ever happened, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it is brilliant. God can, can pull this together. So in the end, the whole cosmos is going to reflect what it looks like when a cosmos is operating according to the love of God and is, is perfectly united, participating in the, in the life of God. Uh, when the cosmos is fully restored, fully healed, fully purified and perfected, it's going to reflect God's character, and we are going to reflect God's character, and the animals are going to reflect God's character. Even the little worms are going to reflect the, God's loving character. The whole thing is going to reflect God's shalom and God's love. See, this is what the book of Revelation, I can't ever get away from the book of Revelation for very long, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a spoiler alert. If you go to the end, you find that there's a new heaven and a new earth. New heaven and new earth. Now, when you hear new, don't think replacement. Like this is the, you know, get rid of the old version, here's a new version. I think so many Christians believe that. Uh, no, no, think about when you hear new, it may be helpful to think of it as renewed. A renewed heaven and a renewed earth. Like Jesus' body, there's continuity and discontinuity. There's sameness and difference. So Jesus' resurrected body is the paradigm for all the creation. It will be this earth. We'll recognize it as this earth. Just like we'll recognize each other in heaven. And Paul says that we'll know each other even as we're known now. But it will be a perfect kind of knowing. We'll recognize each other. We're going to have our bodies, and it will be this earth, but it will be different. It will be purified. It will be transformed. Uh, The new improved version, the perfect version of this earth. Uh, C.S. Lewis captures this, I think, uh, in in Chronicles of Narnia, the last book, uh, which is called The Last Battle. And he has a scene where the four children, Edmund and Lucy and Susan and Peter, have been on this long journey, as some of you know who have read the books or have seen the movie. And at the end, they're coming to Aslan's land, which is the, the metaphor for the kingdom of God. And of course, it, 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 things are becoming more real and, and the colors are getting more vivid and, and more beautiful and they're just being wowed by this. But then they begin to sense that something's familiar. They begin to recognize it. And it turns out it's, they're back in Narnia and they're pointing out, oh, that, there's that hill in Narnia and they're back in Narnia and it surprises them because Aslan had said that you can never return to Narnia. In fact, the, Narnia had, had, had taken over. It's, it's gone. And yet here they are. And so the guy who's going along with them, I forget his name, he explains, uh, Lord Dogfree or Godfrey or Dockery, Dockery, Hickory, Dickery, Dock. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever that guy's name is. He, he, he says this. He goes, when Aslan said that you could never go back to Narnia, he meant the Narnia that you were thinking of, that old Narnia. The fallen Narnia. That's the only one that they were used to. But that was not the real Narnia, C.S. Lewis says. That had a beginning and an end, that Narnia. That Narnia was just a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and always will be here. Just as our own world, England, and all, is only a shadow or copy of something in Aslan's real world. He says, you need not mourn over Narnia, Lucy. Don't cry over it. All of the old Narnia that mattered and all of the dear creatures have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door. Because the door is kind of a portal that goes from one dimension to the other. And of course, it is different, this, this Narnia, as different as the real thing is from a shadow or as the waking thing is from a dream. Okay, so now Lewis here this is a little too platonic for my taste, if you know what that refers to. But he captures, I think, this really important point, and that is that heaven isn't somewhere out there, way far away, different planet or something. Heaven is going to be here. In fact, all of the biblical depictions about the final state of things depicted as being on the earth. We've got this idea that we're going to leave here and go somewhere else and the world goes to hell in a handbasket. No, it will be this earth. But it will be this earth in its perfected form. This, this earth in its, its ideal form, purged of all the corrupting influences that presently corrupt this earth. We'll recognize it. So in, 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 in this, this earth, the greens will be greener, the reds will be redder, the taste will be more vivid. Everything is more alive, as, as the children described Aslan's land. Uh, they're more awake. Everything's more vivid. And that's why C.S. Lewis describes this present world that we are in as being shadow lands. It's just a shadow. 
We don't really see clearly here. Uh, we, we don't experience things all that vividly. We, we, we are, though we don't know it, we're half awake. We're under this deception. This is, we're under the shadow. But someday, praise God, the shadow will be removed. And, and then will be manifested the world that God had always intended the world to be, populated with people with bodies as bodies were always supposed to be. And in that world, that new earth, that renewed earth, renewed heaven, that's where everything will be reflecting the character of God, the love of God, the joy of God, and will be free of all that causes the pain and the suffering in this world right now. So I, I, I'm going to end with just giving three brief, brief words about what our hope is, what our call is, and what our choice is. Here's the hope. The hope is, 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 that, is, is that right now we're in this groaning creation, and Paul says it's filled with futility and frustration, and it is because it's all breaking down. And you for young folks, you probably don't believe me on this, but give you another 30 years, you'll know what I'm talking about. It breaks down. You get frustrated. Oh, it gets really, it's frustrating. But it's not just on a physical level that, that things break down. On a social level, and we're seeing this now in this world, the, the, creation, the whole creation's groaning on a social level too, on a political level. Things are coming unraveled. You see, and, and I, I believe that we could be facing some real hardships as we're going into the future, but remember as we go into this, lock this in, God does not abandon what he loves. He doesn't abandon what he creates because what he creates, he loves, and what he loves, he's fighting for. And that's what he's doing right now. Now, I, I, here's the thing. I don't know. And what the resurrection shows is that that, that, that that fight was victorious. In principle, he's already defeated the, the principalities and powers. But when this is fully manifested, see, I, and I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like. I, it, who knows? And it's described by a lot of different metaphors in the Bible. But at the end of the age, there'll be something supernatural. Sometimes it's referred to as the appearing of Jesus or the manifestation of Jesus or the coming of Jesus. These are all different ways of talking about this reality at the end of the age. When, when Jesus is going to be manifested, and that's when the purging happens, and that's when the, the eternal kingdom begins. But see, when that happens, then we're going to see this world purged and, 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 and healed uh, and, and, and revived and restored and perfected. Everything that needs Expulsion will be expelled, and everything that needs healing will be healed, praise God. Then, then will the, the, the creation will put on uh, imperishability. This perishable creation puts on imperishability, and the corruptible creation puts on incorruptibility. And then God will be all in all. God's love will define every square inch. Everything will be made compatible. God's love, it sums up in this, God's love wins in the end. Hallelujah. And that is our ultimate hope. That is the ultimate hope. When, when, as we're heading into this tumultuous, tumultuous future, um, hang on to that hope. Trust in the character of God, the love of God, and the promise of God. That this whole thing will be changed. And it could happen at any moment. We don't know. Uh, but be living with that expectation, living with that hope. That's our hope. Here's our call. Our call is really to participate with what God's doing as it's described in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. God's bringing reconciliation everywhere. He's reconciling everything to, its, to one another and to himself, bringing shalom to the whole creation. Our job, for those of us who know this and accept this, is to now participate with God in doing that. That's it. And on this planet, then we're to be the means by which we bring reconciliation wherever there's reconciliation needed. And peace as much as possible wherever peace is needed. And we bring good news wherever good news is needed, and it's needed everywhere for everyone. So, so we're to be participating with God in this. The, the, the word that I got for us that, that captures at least part of what this job is, is this. We need to love and honor what God loves and honors. Right? Love everything, love and honor whatever God loves and honors. God loves and honors your physical body. So if God loves and honors your physical body, you need to honor and love your physical body. Amen. Right now, maybe ain't much to talk about. <laughs> maybe right now it's breaking down. I bet for some people, if I say, hey, you're going to have that body forever, that was bad news for them. They're like, oh, oh, shoot. I was hoping to be taller. <laughs> hey, look at, yeah, it, it'll be a, it won't be that body. It'll be a per perfect version of that body, but it will somehow be able to recognize you. Honor and love what God honors and loves, and he honors and loves your body. Treat your body right. Um, as much as possible, bring wholeness and healing to your body. 
and, and, and watch your attitudes towards your body. Now, I know this sounds kind of strange because we don't usually talk about this, and I think we don't talk about it much because we're too platonized. We have this idea that the soul goes to heaven and forget about the body. But your body is important. Treat it right because someday, even though right now it's broken down and maybe overweight and achy and all the rest, someday that body's going to be glorious. It's going to be magnificent. When we see that body, we're going to go, wow, what a body. <laughs> and we're going to meet it in a godly way. No, it's, it, it, it's going to be glorious. You know what I'm talking about. Honor, treat your body right. Here's a word that I, I, I have not ever taught on this. I, not, I don't know if I've ever thought this thought very much. But it really hit me this week as I was thinking about the significance of our bodies. Be careful with your attitude towards your body. Your attitude. Um, you can't, you are a body and spirit. You can't separate the two. God can, and I don't know how that works, but, 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 but we, what we do with our spirit affects our body. What we do with our body affects our spirit. We're psychosomatic unities. Your attitude towards your body makes a difference. In fact, there's, a, there's an increasing amount of scientific evidence that shows that your attitude towards your body affects your body. You, get, you hate your body, then your body is not going to, it will act like a body that's worth hating. Uh, people who have positive attitudes and are grateful and all that, they heal faster. Their, their bodies decay less. They're less prone towards dementia. Be careful about your attitude towards your body because it can affect, it percolates onto everything else. And I'm talking from experience here, and I'm preaching to myself here, because I am coming out of a patch right now. For, for a while, I hated my body. I was so mad at my body. I, I gave up on my body. <laughs> I, I used to be so disciplined and exercising and all the rest, and then my body fell apart and achy. and came to a point where I was just like, fine. You want to be like that? I'll just ride this old carcass into the sunset, you know? <laughs> Watch me decay in slow motion. You, you, you give up on it. Too much work. I got an amen over here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm realizing, no, I, I, I got, you be careful with this. I, I'm going to have this body for a long time, and someday it's going to be glorious, but I got to start treating it right now. And so as much wholeness and health that you can bring to it, bring to it. Honor God with your body. And not just in terms of how you treat your body, but what you do with your body. Honor God with your body. Paul makes a big emphasis on, on, on this in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6. Your body is precious. Don't cheapen it by giving it away easily. Mm. Your body is so precious. Don't give yourself away fully until you're in a covenant where that's appropriate. Honor God with your body. God also honors and loves the entire creation. And if God loves and honors this entire creation, then we should too. Yeah, it's not all it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's broken down. Yeah, it's funky. It doesn't perfectly reflect the character of God. Yeah, it's oppressed by the principalities and powers. Still, we're called to honor and love this creation. In fact, as I said earlier, that's our first mandate. First thing God tells us, that's our job description. We're the caretakers of this earth. It's all our responsibility. And somehow, if everything's going screwy right now, that's on us too. We need to love and honor the, the, this creation. So at the very least, it means this. And, and I, I know, Lord, help us to hear these words because I really think these, this is more important than we tend to think of it because we tend to be thinking of heaven as apart from this earth. But as much good as you can do to the environment and to the animal kingdom, do it. That's part of our participating with God to carry out Amen. Colossians 1, 19, 20. And the other side is, as much as possible, harm the environment as little as possible and cause animals to suffer as little as possible. Internalize this. Look at your life. Take this seriously. Uh, we're ambassadors of the kingdom. We need to honor and love everything God honors and love. And, and so honor and love the environment and the animal kingdom. Look at your lifestyle choices. Look at your food choices. Look at your clothing choices. And, 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 and ask the Lord, is, is, am I being a good steward with this? Honor and love the earth and the animal kingdom. And then the third thing, that's our hope, that's our call. Last thing is our choice. Because there's always a choice. The bottom line is this. This new world is coming. This transformed world is coming. And in that world, everything will be compatible with love. Everything will reflect the love of God. Which means if we're going to be part of that kingdom, we've got to be transformed perfectly into the love of God. And everything that's contrary to that love is not going to be in that kingdom. God will be all in all, so everything that's opposed to God won't be there. And see, if you shave it all down, what is the whole purpose of this life? Ultimately, 
I mean, it involves us becoming compatible with that, that coming reality, so that we can be citizens of the kingdom of God, become compatible with it, which means we have to die to all that's incompatible with that. And this is what Jesus means when he says, if you, if you lose your life, you'll find it. See, in the end, to get into the kingdom, everything's got to be purged that's not of the kingdom, that's not of God. Our job is to do that now, to be doing that now. To, make any second, to die to selfishness. Die to greed. Die to everything in our life that is contrary to the love of God. To become pa- compatible with the kingdom that's coming. And the only way to get compatible with the kingdom that's coming is to get compatible with Jesus. Because it's the kingdom of Jesus that reflects Jesus, and it's all going to be summed up into Jesus. So the ending question here is, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Um, It involves trusting Jesus, that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for all creation, he did for all people, but he also did it for you. So you own that. And you embrace the fact that you're loved with a perfect, everlasting love. Uh, And then you put your trust in Jesus, which means you surrender your life to Jesus. You've probably been... We're all conditioned to live as though we were the Lord of our own life, as though we had a right to our own life. We don't have to answer to anybody. That's a lie. Amen. Truth is, we're created for God. We're owned by God. And he purchased us on Calvary. We owe him our all. And so, so surrender your life to him, you see. And then when you do that, what the Bible says is he, he puts his own spirit inside of you. This is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's inside of you now, there is this new life. The resurrection life starts to pulsate in you. And, and it starts to move you in a direction where you learn how to love God better. And you see the beauty of, of God in Jesus Christ. You fall more and more in love with God. And then you fall more in love with people. And you even be de- develop a capacity to love the people that don't love you, that maybe are your enemies. You fall more in love with God. You fall more in love with people. You fall more in love with yourself. And then you fall more and more in love with this creation and, and, and the animal kingdom that, that God has created. See, now you are, part, now, now you're in the life of God. You're loving what God loves. You're doing what God does. Uh, you're, you're a partner with his. And, and see, when you embrace that, now you can embrace this hope, uh, this confident hope that we have that in the end, God's going to bring it all together. And, and, and it's going to be a, a outlandishly beautiful, gorgeous tapestry. You can have that hope. However the world goes, you have this hope. If you're not now surrendered to Jesus, I encourage you to do that. You know, that's not a magical thing where all of a sudden you purchase fire insurance or something. That's a pledge to start living differently, okay? You're going to start walking a different way. And so if you want to make that decision, do it. And I encourage you, if you see the light, do it now because I can't promise you'll see the light tomorrow. Whatever you do, you get better at doing. And if you're resisting God, you get better and better at doing that. And that's scary. So if you see the light, surrender your life to Christ. And if you make that choice, I encourage you to tell somebody about it. Yeah, come up and talk to the prayer teams, perhaps, or go out to the, the visiting area. Uh, lock that in. And then you make a commitment to start getting involved in the community of God's people. We can't walk this out alone. It involves all of us. We're learning to love together. That's what our slogan is all about. We're learning how to become compatible with the kingdom together. We're preparing for our eternal life in the kingdom together. Jesus rose from the dead, praise God, and that changed everything. It's good news for you individually, but it's good news for animals. It's good news for all of creation. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? I, I want to say that the, uh, we have the Muse cast on Tuesday. Check it out. Dan and, and, and Shauna uh, go over the message and have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, we got the gathering groups this week. I encourage you to check out those if you're not part of those. And um, I'm going to close with this prayer. Abba, Father, thank you for the work that you have done in Jesus Christ on the cross, giving your life for us and for this whole creation. Give us a vision, Lord, of where you're going, of what this creation will look like and what we will look like, though we can't begin to even imagine it. And burn in our hearts, Holy Spirit, continue to burn in our hearts a love for Jesus Christ, a love for people, and a love for the earth and the animal kingdom. And help us to be willing to sacrifice, give us the wisdom to sacrifice, to express that love, in every way, shape, and form we can. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, God bless you guys. Go out and have a wonderful Easter day.